Here, I mean, I've been doing a lot of speaking, but not in law school. That's the thing is, medical school. Yeah, I've been watching on social media. It seems like every day you're somewhere else. <laughs> it does seem like it. Yeah. Not quite. Yeah. yeah. Well, welcome, yeah. welcome. Um, to have a drink of water, and I won't do an extremely long introduction. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, everybody, please join me in welcoming Professor Dorothy Roberts. <laughs> One of my sheroes, a um, someone whose work I have always greatly, greatly admired, and uh, and has inspired much of my own research in racial justice and gender justice with with deep historical roots, and that certainly characterizes so much of your writing. Um, professor Roberts, I want to get your titles right. Is the George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and sociology at the University of um, Pennsylvania, but also the Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Moselle Alexander, that is a mouthful, is. professor of civil rights. And um, it's just our enormous uh, 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 fortune to have you join us today. We're here to talk about your newest book, Torn Apart, which is just a tour de force. Um, a, uh, and in so many ways builds on killing the black body um, shattered Bonds, which was an earlier effort to think about the uh, child policing, um, so-called child welfare system. Um, and this book in many ways updates what that work was. But if you haven't read Killing the Black Body, um, I recommend it so highly. It's just a um, paradigm shifting piece of work, as is, as is this work. Um, and, and so I just want to invite you to say a little bit about why you returned to the subject why it was you felt the need to say i have more to say about this yeah. we need to know more about it <laughs> and can oh, i ask you to um let me to do the oh, mic because we've yeah, got a please. we've got some folks on zoom okay and all right um, great even better so thank you okay. for joining us oh sure thank you so much for that introduction very touching <laughs> and uh it's um it's nice to reconnect after I mean we, it seems like we used to be in touch person you know in person maybe when I was at Rutgers I don't know but where were you you were somewhere else before too when we all started I I interviewed at the University of Pennsylvania when I was on the entry level teaching market mm -hmm. I wasn't there <laughs> then there no, no, no. There they wouldn't have taken me either back no, then. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, yeah. we used to okay. see each other a lot more, but yeah. COVID and then yeah, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. So join us. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. So, uh, as Professor Frankie said, I wrote "Killing the Black Body," which is this book is related to, but not as directly as "Shattered Bonds." But "Killing the Black Body" was published in 1997. And that's a book about the longstanding devaluation of Black women's childbearing. And while I was working on that book, which originated with my interest in investigating the prosecutions of Black women for being pregnant and using drugs in the late 1980s, early 1990s, I started teaching in 1988. And it was right at the time that these prosecutions were beginning. And that was my the first subject of my legal research and activism was around those prosecutions, contesting the prosecutions. But while I was doing that research, I discovered the child welfare system, or what I think we should call the family policing system, uh, because the same mothers who were being prosecuted were also accused of child neglect. And not only that, far more were being accused of child maltreatment and having their newborn babies taken from them, thousands upon thousands. And so as I was in contact with these mothers uh, and their lawyers and activists in, in the now growing reproductive justice movement, uh, I learned about the far more frequent child removals and that led me into 
discovering, which I didn't know before, the gross numbers of Black children who are taken from their families. I had no idea it was as astounding as it was. At, at the time, Black children were the largest group of children in foster care. But, you know, even though Black children are a minority of children in the United States, I think at the time, maybe 13 percent, and they were over a third of the children in foster care. And more Black children were in foster care than white children. New York City was, it was just mind boggling, the disparities. Hardly any white children were in foster care in New York City. And Black and brown children were almost all of the children in foster care. Uh, nationally, four times as likely for a Black child to be put in foster care than a white child. And it just seemed to me immediately that this was a racist institution. I, what, you know, what other state imposed institution on black people that's made up mostly of black people would be seen as something benevolent? You know, we would think something was wrong if, you know, in any other institution, you'd at least have some theory of oppression surrounding it. Do you know what I mean? That some questioning of the benevolence of an institution that not only was state imposed, made up disproportionately of black people, but also caused huge harm to communities and families and individuals, which were, was well recognized, except for in the case of black people. And, and, you know, even with, and, you know, the other is indigenous tribes where we, there's a long history of taking Native children from their homes as a literal weapon of war. Uh, and, uh, but people could see it's a weapon of war. It, they may excuse it, you know, try to justify it. But with Black children, it was this, this idea at the time, and it still circulates today, that this is helping these children. And so few people seem to even approach it as a political issue. So the strangest thing, you know, sociologists, for example, rarely studied it. Now there's a growing group of junior sociologists who've written their dissertations on the system and they're doing terrific work pointing out all the disparities and the harms and all of that and, and, and analyzing it as a political institution. But back in 2000, you know, when I started doing the research, there, there wasn't any, there, there were no books like that. Uh, no one was writing about it. The, the child welfare scholars who were writing about it and documented these disparities, most of it was trying to erase the racism in the system by controlling for other things and saying, oh, it's not really race, or Black children are more likely to be in the system because they have greater needs and they need these so-called services. <laughs> you know, but the service, the main service for Black families uh, was at the time and continues to be foster care, taking children away. So uh, I decided to write my book, Shattered Bonds, which was published in 2001, and uh, documented these disparities and made the argument that this is a form of harm, you know, oppression uh, against Black people. And uh, so now, 20 years later, uh, there were some people who suggested I should write a new preface to Shattered Bonds and publish a 20th anniversary edition of the book. I did that with Killing the Black Body. And uh, I thought about it. I had a conversation with my editor at Basic Books and he said, well, tell me what you put in the preface. <laughs> I said, you know, what's changed? I said, well, for one thing, what hasn't changed over 20 years is that there still is this terrible disparity, racial disparity. The system functions the same way. It completely relies on the threat of taking children away, still invested in you know, reports, sus suspicions, investigates, uh, regulates families, takes children away from their families, the same harms, the same purposes of the system. All of that is the same. But 
I've changed in my perspective. I spent 20 years doing a lot of efforts to reform the system, including spending nine years on, a, we called it a panel. It was a, a group of five of us child welfare experts who were commissioned by the state of Washington uh, selected by the attorneys on both sides. I was selected by the plaintiffs uh, in a big class action lawsuit uh, claiming and finding that the state of Washington was violating the constitutional rights of children in foster care. And as a result of the settlement, uh, the parties agreed that they would select a panel of five experts who would make a plan for Washington to reform its system and monitor it. And it was supposed to last seven years. After seven years, not much had happened. You know, it, the system was basically the same. So then we extended it two more years. So nine, I, mean, I can't even hardly believe it, I, almost a decade of uh, my life and, and everyone else involved uh, was spent trying to fix all the terrible problems in this system. It, and one thing about it that was so frustrating is that it was completely focused on improving foster care, not on ending foster care. It, there was no attention paid to the parents, even though I, I advocated for that throughout, uh, but it was really focused on better training for foster parents, fixing just the sloppiness in the system with children who would be moved to, you know, taken from their families, put in a foster home and the school records weren't transferred. And so the kids just weren't enrolled in school or their medical records were misplaced. So nobody knew the medical needs of the children, you know, including children who are taken on grounds of medical neglect, you know, foster parents who just couldn't handle it. So they had a big turnover rate. Case workers were overburdened. They couldn't find the extreme cases because they were overburdened with all these minor cases that should never have been cases in the first place and children running away. A big problem was all the children who run away and live in the streets in Seattle. You know? And so um, that experience and lots of other reform efforts convinced me that reform was never going to work. And then I also got very interested and involved in prison abolition and, and learned the principles of abolition and was very drawn to abolitionist and abolitionist approach to carceral systems. And I could see that this was a carceral system that had the same logic as police and prisons, worked with police and prisons, you know, deeply entangled with them, inseparable from police and prisons. And, and then there was also a growing movement to, uh, you know, effectively abolish, but people weren't necessarily using that term, but radically transform the way we approach children's needs. And all of that had happened over those 20 years. And when I explained all of that, you know, in about an hour conversation, <laughs> my editor said, oh, you, you need to write a new book. You've, this is a different book, right, than Shattered Bonds. And so uh, I said, yeah, I, th I actually think that's right. I think I want to write a book that is a case for abolition of this system. So that's, that's why. And, and mm -hmm. you do make the case very strongly. But it's one of the observations you make early in the book is that the prison abolition movement and also the Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. movement for Black Lives um, invest or divest invest um, sort of strategy yeah. has not connected the dots sufficiently, in your view, between the family policing system and the larger prison industrial complex. Yeah. And that it, and, and, in, and worse than that, sometimes they argue that we should divest from police and invest in ch in child welfare. Right. Yes. Right. So yes. How has that gone in terms of trying to get those movements to right. be in conversation? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of progress on that uh, since I wrote uh, the first the article. I wrote an article ab about it, um, a couple articles, uh, pointing out that some activists who were calling for 
defunding the police were arguing that one of the places, as you said, that they should put the money taken from police budgets is in uh, child protective services or, you know, the, the departments of human services, which are the ones that manage child protective services. And uh, I think people, many people just don't realize how the system operates. It's done such a good job of convincing the public that it is a benevolent institution that provides support for needy families and removes children when there's absolutely no other option to save their lives because the parents are, you know, are monsters basically. And if they don't come in there, the parents are going to, or other family caregivers will kill these children or severely uh, harm them. And so this is a, a life-saving institution and people don't realize how many investigations go on, what investigations entail. They don't know the extent of racism in the system, both in terms of the statistical disparities, but the history of the system and also the way in which it's so well documented how racist stereotypes influence child welfare decision making at every single level. And people just don't don't know that if they haven't been affected by it. Uh, and so it seems logical and beneficial that one thing you should do is uh, take money from police who are known to be violent and oppressive and move it into this system that helps people. Uh, so it, it's part of it is just, I think, a lack of knowledge and conscious awareness of how the system operates. Now that that there that's changing though, and there are uh, movements, you know, parts of the movement for Black Lives in Los Angeles, for example. The movement for Black Lives there has uh, has been very vocal about abolishing the family policing system. Uh, also, uh, Indigenous groups that are advocating for uh, abolition of the prison industrial complex have recognized, you know, in part because of their long history of having families uh, destroyed and disrupted by the U.S. government, you know, in a deliberate effort of genocide and cultural assimilation into white culture, so-called white culture. Um, that they and they have a long history of you know specifically advocating against child removal not to say that other groups don't as well but it just hasn't been as organized it hasn't been as organized and so uh, there are those examples where there's this recognition that any movement to abolish the prison industrial complex has to also include a movement to abolish family policing because, because they're so entangled with each other. So you could tell the story that, that really this all started in the 1960s when the Good Society, Great Society, Social Welfare, Safety Net of the Johnson administration, other social services agencies were created. That's not the story you're telling. No, no, it's, it's part of the story. Well, it's yeah. part of the story. I think it is important to note these historic milestones in the history of family separation and its use to subordinate marginalized communities. But yeah, but I would trace it all the way back to settler colonialism and and slavery in the colonies, uh, because that's where the, you know, first of all, the idea that white settlers should decimate native people, indigenous people, and uh, the idea of, you know, the formal idea of kidnapping native children and putting them in military detention centers and then eventually in orphanages and uh, and then eventually have them adopted out to white families. 
Uh, that began during the so-called Indian Wars and, and actually a late stage of them in the 19th century. But the idea of destroying indigenous culture, you know, to civilize uh, native people and dispossess them of their land, that goes back to the, you know, the very origin, the beginnings of, uh, of the of settling the colonies. And then the the idea of uh, that black people should be subject to family separation and under the authority of white people, uh, that black people are incapable of raising their own children, that it's better for black children to be under the supervision of white people. That idea goes back to slavery and the, 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 authority of the white and male enslaver who was the head of the plantation family, which included all the enslaved people. And, you know, he had authority, complete legal authority over black families and black families could be separated the moment they reached the shores of North America or at any moment, you know, to punish them, to make them uh, keep them compliant, uh, or for economic reasons, to pay off a debt, to uh, just to make some more money off the sale of a father, mother, children. Uh, at on the auction block, black families were routinely separated because different people wanted to purchase different family members. So that was that was an integral part of the institution of slavery. And then after slavery ended, uh, this is where it's not just you know, a prelude to the formal child welfare system. It actually is the beginning of the formal child welfare system for black families was the apprenticeship system where immediately upon the end of the civil war and the emancipation of black people, white former enslavers went to judges and filed petitions to apprentice black children and and judges by the tens of thousands returned black children to their former enslavers to work for them under the the same conditions of slavery you know other than the legal um uh I, mean, I, I suppose it's, you know, it's, I'm not trying to downplay the importance of Black people not being actual chattel property, but the conditions under which they were forced to work were similar. And that is a formal court system to remove Black children from their parents on grounds of neglect and put them under the authority of strangers. You know, that's what foster care is today. So I think to me, that's the origin of the of foster care for black families. Now, on the other hand, though, the what we think of, you know, what's generally seen as the formal child welfare system, which emerged in the 19th century, uh, starting with charitable, you know, white benevolent charitable organizations that mostly dealt with impoverished white families, especially immigrant families. And black children were excluded from that. Uh, they were more likely to be deemed delinquent and put in the emerging juvenile justice so justice system or legal system uh, than to go into foster care, what you know, was emerging as foster care. Uh, but now we get to the civil rights movement and you know the period you're talking about or you mentioned <laughs> where uh we see black people agitating for inclusion in the new deal social welfare programs and getting access to welfare benefits but as well as you know challenging the jim crow regime. But we can then see their inclusion in the child welfare system as a backlash against the gains of the civil rights movement, because at the very same time that Black Americans were gaining access to 
you know, to democracy, uh, to economic opportunities, uh, you start to see, beginning with Southern states, dropping Black, mostly Black single mothers from the welfare rolls on grounds that they didn't have suitable homes. And then the rule that if you were going to deny welfare to a family because there wasn't a suitable home, you had to take the children away and put them in foster care. And so we begin to see in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, this continual skyrocketing of the foster care population it, you know, it, to astronomical levels. Prior to the 1960s, there were hardly any children in foster care. There were, you know, the, and those would have been white children. The most white children were given services in their homes. I was still, you know, a, a stingy, a punitive, you know, stigmatizing system, but at least most of the funds went to services for children in their homes. Now, with the the families coming into the you know the broader welfare state, you see this dramatic shift where child welfare services become removing children from their homes. And the most of the money spent on that and the population, just I don't have the figures in front of me, but you know, I should know it, but you know, just astronomically mushrooming beyond anything anyone could have ever imagined prior to the entry of black families into this into this formal system. And uh and can I go a little bit more historically to bring it into the 90s? Okay, so now, so then what happens in the 1990s, you see this, these three laws passed under the Clinton administration. Uh, first, the crime control bill. And this is another example how these punitive policies are all entangled uh, that uh, sent more police officers into black communities uh, and, and led to the explosion of the prison population, again, with black people disproportionately filling prison cells. And uh, then in 1996, you have the welfare restructuring law that abolished the federal entitlement to welfare. And of course, that was argued based on the myth of the welfare queen, that Black mothers were having babies just to get a welfare check and were spending all the money on themselves, not on their children. And this is, you know, again, a policy that's based on this myth that begins you know, a century earlier uh, about or more about the unfit Black mother who doesn't really care for her children, the Black, I mean, I would trace this all the way back to the slavery era, the idea that Black families don't really have strong, loving bonds. So, it's, you know, separating them doesn't make any difference to them. Um, and uh, all of, you know, those racist stereotypes were what fueled the end of the federal entitlement to welfare. You know, this is a major change in U.S. welfare policy. Uh, and then a year later, Everybody knows, I think, about welfare reform and restructuring, right? But not that many people have been aware of the law that was passed right a year later, which, again, completely entangled with it, the Adoption and Safe Families Act passed in 1997, which was supposed to address this skyrocketing foster care population, especially as I mentioned earlier, the numbers of black children who were in foster care, who were not being returned home, not being adopted, and they were, the term used was languishing in foster care. We have to do something about it. And the answer was to terminate their mother's rights. That was the answer. And so ASFA speeds up termination of parental rights. It presumes that parental rights should be terminated. That's the end of the legal relationship between children. They can be adopted to others. That There's no right that the parents or, or any of their family now has to um, have a relationship with them, uh, un, un, you know, unless 
it's a, a family member who adopts the child. But uh, the the I, the preference for many people who explicitly said that was was for white people to adopt these children, and uh, no similar pri pri uh, prioritizing of returning children home. Uh, the financialist incentives for uh, uh, states to increase the numbers of adoptions out of foster care. No similar incentive to return children home or to not take them away from their families in the first place. And so this was the first time in modern U.S. history where there was federal law requiring states to protect children from harm, which you know had become, for Black families, taking them away from their families. Uh, but no parallel or corollary or joint uh, requirement that the states provide support for the families that they are targeting to take away. Uh, so, you know, this is, this is really a major, major change in the U.S. welfare state that the approach to impoverished families isn't even to give them the stingy you know, support they were getting prior to welfare restructuring, but instead to rely on uh, getting them adopted into more privileged families. You know, just really striking. And this is all fueled by stereotypes about Black families and, of course, impacts Black families the most. They're the most likely to have their parental rights terminated of any, any uh, well, probably around the same with Indigenous uh, families as well. You know, as you tell this story, I'm reminded of a, a story I tell in Wedlock. Yeah. Uh, that... Um, that I think underscores in, an, in a particularly perverse way what you've been talking mm -hmm. about, which is um, part of why I, I postulate that the same-sex marriage movement was so successful so quickly was the white endowment that it enjoyed. Yes. That it was mostly white couples that yes. were at least figured in the, the figure, imagination. Exactly, yes. The United States and yes. were the deserving couples, yes. deserving of the blessing and dignities of marriage, and for that to work, they had to conjure a what we would call a constitutive other. Yeah. The undeserving families, right. which are always racialized exactly. yes. in the United States. Yes. And the most extreme example of that is the litigation in the Seventh Circuit, mm -hmm. challenging bans on same-sex marriage in the early 2010s, mm -hmm. pre Obergefell, case that ends up before Ju Judge Posner, mm -hmm. where the, um, the gay rights groups argue that part of why it's a good thing for same-sex couples to be able to marry is that people are more willing to serve as foster parents if they're married, oh, and that gay people, right. when married, yeah. are four times more likely to raise their right. hand yeah. to be a foster parent. Yeah. Um, and that, for that reason, it's a good thing to let gay right. people marry. Right, right. So here we have white gay couples yeah. getting married in order to collaborate in the removal Yes. Black children from so-called dysfunctional Black families. Right. And it just turned That's, my stomach yeah. when Justice, Judge Posner actually cites that argument as yeah. one of the main reasons why we should allow gay people to marry. Yeah, yeah, I, and I'm, I'm not surprised. And by the way, thank you so much for your work on this. And, and no, and the, it's so important, the, you know, recognizing when, what our politics should be, basically. You know, I think that's a lot of what we've been talking about. Uh, what, who, who should we collaborate with? Who are our political allies? And what, what should be off the table? What are, exactly, yes. That argument, exactly. that's not okay. I, I so agree, no. I so agree. So you, you describe in the book this entire dynamic as not just racism, although it's that, yeah. but of a form of racial capitalism. Yeah. Yeah, and before you jump in a little bit, I okay. want to invite Miranda, who wrote about this for today. Oh, okay. And we've got a few students who wrote for today, who I'm going to draw into the conversation a little more um, actively. And Miranda said some really interesting things about this racial capitalism framing. 
Hi, thank you so much for taking the time to speak oh, with us. You're welcome. Thank um, you for reflecting on, on this aspect of my book. Go on. Um, yeah, this definitely drew my attention when I um, read the excerpt we were given. Um, and um, one of the, the questions that I had when I was reading was um, because you called attention to the fact that the system was designed to do these harms. Mm -hmm. And I found myself asking, um, you know, why was it designed to do this? Mm -hmm. um, because um, the idea of harming children by design is so horrifying. Yeah. Um, and so I then was asking the question, sort of who profits from this? And that led me to sort of learn more about um, the, I mean, the, the history that you described leading from slavery, but also um, the for-profit um, foster care industry. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was only able to read the excerpt and I know that it mentioned that you sort of explored the, um, the capitalist design more in a different part of your book. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could speak more to that. Sure, yes, I, I write about the foster industrial complex uh, in another chapter. And uh, that includes both the for-profit foster care. So uh, there are, or private, so let, let me make a distinction. So there's privatization of foster care, which could, which entails child welfare departments entering into contracts with companies whose business is to manage their foster care systems. Now those companies could be for-profit or not-for-profit. So uh, in a literal sense, it's not necessarily a for-profit business. Uh, but in a broader sense, it's all for profit in the sense that there are people making money off of this system. Uh, the system hires uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of people who uh, work as caseworkers or administrators. Uh, then it enters into contracts with foster caretakers who are getting benefits from it. Not, not all people who are in the foster system are doing it for the money, but there are many who are earning a living by keeping as many children as they can in their homes to earn the benefits that are greater than the benefits that uh, people get from, the, from temporary assistance for needy families. Uh, so there's, and I could go on, you can imagine all the people that are making money off of the system, uh, judges and uh, lawyers and consultants, all the therapists who are hired by these systems to, to give therapy, investigate, evaluate the families, you know, so just lots and lots of people. But then uh, many state and local child welfare departments take the social security benefits of children in foster care, the survivor benefits or disability benefits. And I write about how um, many of these, co there are companies that are dedicated to finding children who have these benefits and encouraging or helping the state to put more of them into foster care and become the rep financial representatives of these children. So all that money is going into the coffers. There's some jurisdictions that charge the parents for the costs of keeping children in foster care. And by the way, those benefits that they're taking, I would say stealing from the children, don't go to benefit the children. They just go into the coffers of the government to use however they want to use it. It's not like they're spending the money on improving the welfare of the children who are the, the real beneficiaries or should be the beneficiaries. Um, so there's all of that. Okay, then there's the contracts with companies at, which in some states really manage the foster care system. They select the foster parents, they pay them, they 
supposedly supervise them, although there's lots of evidence they don't do a very good job of it as they're in it. Uh, whether it's nonprofit or not, they're in it to make money. Right? So um, they have a financial incentive to keep children in homes as long as possible. They, they're disincentivized from removing children from homes if there's evidence of maltreatment in the foster home. Uh, so there's all of that as well. So lots and lots of people who are making money off of the system. Uh, but I think to me, the even more profound an important relationship to racial capitalism is the way in which it supports the view that the reason for unmet human needs in our society, you know, for childhood poverty, for children who are experiencing educational or medical neglect, for children who are at home as their parents try to get a job because they don't have childcare, you know, all these reasons why children are taken away, that the, it's all the fault of their parents. It's not because of our cap racist, capitalist, you know, patriarchal, uh, ableist uh, structures in our society. It's because of unfit pathological parents. And that thinking is a powerful way to dissuade people from advocating for social change or to persuade them that we have a fair and just society that doesn't need to be fixed. Uh, or, you know, I guess I, I don't like to say fixed anymore because that's what, <laughs> that's what they said <laughs> that we need to do with the child welfare system. So, you know, that needs to be radically transformed. And um, I, to me, that's the, 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 you know, the deepest connection to racial capitalism. Uh, but I really like your question because I think it's so important to ask when people want to hold on to a system or a practice, a policy that we know is extremely harmful. Like you said, why would we have a system that it's documented? I mean, there's so much evidence that children who are in foster care are at high risk of all sorts of harms of low income and poverty, incarceration, mental uh, illness, uh, uh, houselessness, you know, all just all sorts of bad outcomes. And uh, why then do we keep it? And I think that the question I'd like to ask is the people who want to keep it, what is their investment in this system? And for some people, it's financial, directly financial. And for some people, it's ideological. Uh, and some people, it's personal. I mean, I, you know, I won't mention any names, but there's people who just fought to keep this system, take more Black children away. You know, literally wrote in, I would law review articles that Black children would be better off with white parents. And, you know, the kinship care is, is harmful. You know, the community, the whole entire community is dangerous. So they'd be better off taken away. And, uh, you know, I think for some of them, it's personal. <laughs> you know? And I'll leave it at that because I don't, I don't, I actually don't like to give, you know, psychoanalytic uh, personal, but that's, that's been my conclusion over battling with some of these people who say the most atrocious things about Black families and believe, it seems, claim that they uh, don't have a racist bone in their bodies. They just want to get these services to these deprived Black children. And uh, very often, if you dig deep enough, you see that there's some personal experience that they are trying to justify. Um, so there's all of these reasons. But, you know, my the one I think we should focus on is the political reason I said about how this ideology and these policies work to uphold uh, an unjust uh, power arrangement in the United States and globally as well.
you may not want to name names, but Joyce McMillan was here a couple of weeks. <laughs> well, Joyce will. More than happy to do that. Joyce. And she had the receipts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do name them in, in Torn Apart. Yes, yes, I do. And but, yes, well, Joyce and I are a good team because <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, but I could have regret it. But you know that comedy bit where uh, President Obama was it? Yeah, so he had his uh, the person who would say what Obama wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, that's why <laughs> a version of that maybe with me and Joyce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So okay go on. <laughs> you have this wonderful term that you use a little bit later on that family policing has a racial geography. Oh yeah. Wonderful, wonderful yeah. concept, very evocative. And you um you've talked tonight about um New York and Washington. Yeah. Yeah. I want to invite Ariana to play geography with okay. us here, who has worked in the family policing system yeah. in, um, in Indiana. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. And yeah. um, not all of it was wonderful. Yeah. Um, hi, Professor Robert. Hi. Thank you so and, much for oh, being thank here. Thank you. Um, yeah, when I was an undergrad, I interned for a public defender in South Bend who um, did basically all chins cases, um, which... Uh, for anyone who's not familiar, under Indiana law, CHIN stands for Child in Need of Services. And the Indiana Code basically defines all of these instances in which a child can be labeled CHIN. So that can be anything from being a missing child to simply misbehaving in school to simply being born with prenatal exposure to um, certain substances. And the way that a child can be kind of deemed CHINs um, is through this mandatory reporting system. Indiana is one of these states that has a regime in which anybody can be, anybody is, or everybody is supposed to report what they deem to be instances or suspicions of abuse. So obviously that deputizes everybody a, a child comes into contact with to potentially be a reporter. Um, and so my essay kind of, I guess, allowed me to expand from personal experience on some of the themes you brought up in your family surveillance chapter, um, particularly how families who are facing separation um, kind of are presented with this laundry list of services that they must receive and requirements that they must fulfill in order to prove parental fitness. And this is actually taken from one of the comments on my um, essay. So I hope that Jack is okay with me kind of co-opting this, but I think Jack very apt, aptly summarized um, one of the key injustices of the system I was working in, which is that there's this like massive credibility and accountability asymmetry in the CHIN system. So a CPS employee only has to show credible evidence of abuse in order to open a CHIN's case. Um, a reporter can be anonymous and basically just bring a frivolous um, claim. But then the process that parents have to go through in order to then rebut those allegations of parental unfitness is far more costly and burdensome. So I was just wondering if you could talk more about those costs of compliance. Yeah, sure. And uh, you've highlighted one of the main aspects of family policing, which is forcing parents or other family caretakers into compliance with a set of mandates that rarely have anything to do with the allegations or and certainly don't help. Uh, parent training classes, for example, is one of the main ones almost always uh, required, uh, even if it, the problem wasn't that the parent needed to be trained to be, you know, a more caring person or have better parental skills. Um, and I think it, you know, it fits into the the policing aspect of this system because that is a way in which now the courts and caseworkers police, monitor, supervise uh, families. And it turns into not a, a, an approach of providing what the children need if children's unmet needs were the reason they caught the case, um, but just uh, supervising, surveilling, uh, shaming 
uh, you know, there's a whole ritual where the parents are shamed in court. Uh, and also it's a way of preventing activism, a, a way of preventing people from organizing and challenging the system because you're at risk of never getting your children back if you object, uh, if you complain, and certainly if you take up any kind of political action, if you do something for the care of your children that uh, does, isn't, doesn't fit what the service plan says. Uh, so ironically, parents are punished for showing care for their children. If that care you know, isn't in the form that it has been uh, required, mandated by the state. And so it's a, it, it is a, a really important aspect of policing families. Uh, it becomes then an excuse for terminating parental rights because parental rights can be terminated and are terminated mostly because of failure of parents to comply with some aspect of the service plan, not because there's evidence that the child is going to be harmed if the child's re returned or the parents are completely incapable of caring for the child. It's because they didn't comply in time with everything. That's the reason most parents have their rights terminated. And so uh, that's another aspect of this. Now, you raise some other points in your comment, uh, and one is the, the idea that uh, any suspicion of child maltreatment should be enough to report a family. Uh, that is, as you pointed out, that's a very low bar. It could be anything. And, and it could be from an anonymous reporter. Uh, but even if it's from a mandated reporter, it still means that you're encouraging. And some people believe and they're told you have to do this or you're going to be in trouble with the law. You know, suspicion, suspicion is an invitation for bias. It is so, and, and again, well documented that doctors, teachers, caseworkers, suspicions are shaped by racist stereotypes. There, there's so many studies that, that show this. Uh, and, and, and it's, you know, it should be expected that when you tell people to act on their suspicions, that their biases are going to determine what they think is suspicious. Uh, and, and then the, you know, you pointed out one aspect of the unfair, unjust, unbalanced um, uh, uh, evidentiary requirements, you know, which I could make a, a broader point about the uh, the the terrible imbalance of rights and and power in this system, where parents usually don't even know what their rights are, and then the the you know the rights that are in the U.S. Constitution, like the Fourth Amendment, the requirement of a probable cause for a, a state agent to search your home, rarely applied in the case of child welfare investigations. Uh, and then in the courtroom, the the just the the army of state agents, prosecutors, and uh, judges, and and people hired by the system to uh, to to accuse and find fault with it is the other thing. <laughs> the, what is the purpose of all of this? It's not to find the strengths of the family. It's not to find, uh, it's not to look for why the child could, should stay at home. It's to look for evidence against the family. And that's what's presented in court. So you have this huge imbalance in, uh, in rights and power in in the investigate, in the reporting, in the investigation, and in the court decisions as well. Yeah, Kaylee, you are particularly interested in this issue of mandatory reporting, but also digital surveillance. Yeah, yeah. I invite you to 
pop in now. Well, on both. Should I pack them both together? I have both. That's okay. okay. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. Maybe I'll start with mandatory reporting and then maybe ask a second question. I'm not really sure to loop them together. Um, I did in my paper, but I think maybe out loud it's a bit more complex. Um, so for mandatory reporting, I really enjoyed um, your piece in the excerpt that we read discussing um, just going going into mandatory reporting. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to know teachers and doctors who are amazing and, and well-intentioned, but have yeah. been faced with this issue. What yeah. I talked a bit about my paper was the pressure that, as you said, that suspicion. And um, when it's mandatory, the risk of, and as you said yourself, I, you know, you said it's very, very severe risks if you fail to report the yeah. very improbable likelihood that it's a actual um, situation of neglect or abuse. But those yeah. risks are so high that it's really shoved into them that they have to report every suspicion. Yeah. And so when dealing with that, um, I did a little bit of research into what mandatory reporting, how that came up. Um, and, you know, in the 67, when all the states started having, I think in 74, when it became federal law, there was only about 10,000 reports um, <laughs> na nationwide. And then, um, as you said in your paper, it went up to like 2 million yeah. um, within the decade. So yeah. that's just a wild statistic. And I wanted yeah. to know if you thought, you know, teachers and doctors think that they do have this duty. And I think that is something that at least the people that I've spoken to hold this responsibility, you know, as as the utmost importance, yeah. but at the same time, interested to think how you feel they can balance that again the suspicions which are inherently um, racist and in, in their biases, but at the same time, um, so they can do their job within the parameters that they're responsible for. Yeah. yeah, well, I think mandated reporting interferes with their job. You know, their job is to care either medically for children's health or to teach children, reporting their caregivers to CPS interferes with their education and their health. And with the, these mandated reporters doing what they are trained to do. Now, some of them may feel they don't have all the resources they need. All right, then work on getting the resources you need to meet the needs of the children. So <laughs> mandated reporting puts an extra layer of responsibility on the service providers, you know, doctors and nurses and teachers and social service providers, uh, daycare workers, et cetera, uh, to report as opposed to figure out how they can help support the families, which is what they were professionally trained to do. It does not, so it interferes with that. It interferes with, they're, they're, they're now going to, instead of either using what skills they have to support and help the families meet the needs of the children or figure out a way to enhance the resources that they can provide to really grapple with what can we do if there's a child in need what can we do to meet that need instead they're told call cps which is now going to add trauma and harm to whatever the needs of these children were. Okay, in addition, it is simply not true that these professionals believe they are mandated to report every suspicion because we know they do not do that in the case of wealthy white families. And we have absolute evidence that, it, take for example, uh, drug use while pregnant. We know that Black mothers, especially impoverished Black mothers, are far more likely to be reported to CPS for drug use while pregnant than wealthy white mothers are. Uh, or we could take lots of health problems, for example, that happen in wealthy homes. Unlikely that doctors are going to report the parents for not adequately addressing the, you know, the anorexia. If it, it, we could read the latest memoir of a wealthy person, 
like I'm glad my mom is dead or isn't that one that's been on the bestseller list where she talks about how her mother trained her to be anorexic and everybody knew this. She was working on a TV show. Their doctors must have known it. Nobody reported the mother to CPS. And it's just one example. There's so, it, it's just, we all know this. Doctors know this. It's, it's so they don't really believe that they have to report any evidence of child maltreatment. They believe they have to report it in the case of impoverished families, especially black and, and indigenous families. And so it, it's, it's just not true that there is mandated reporting. And to the extent there is, it's harmful. And also the other thing is it doesn't stop anyone from reporting. It, 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 it tells doctors and teachers, since you were focusing on them, that they must report their suspicions. And in some training classes, this is what they're told. They must report any suspicion, the slightest suspicion. So the vaguest, you know, a gut feeling. But getting rid of that mandate doesn't keep them from reporting. So it, it doesn't harm, you know, people, people say, well, if we don't have mandated reporting, there are going to be these extreme cases where there's nothing the doctor, the teacher could do. No one could help. We got to take the children out. Well, they can still report that. It just means they're not going to report, feel they must report cases where they could actually help the family and avoid the trauma and all the other outcomes of taking, bad outcomes of taking the children away. So it would be better to get rid of mandated reporting. It, it, it would be better for families. And also mandated reporting deters families from seeking all the help they could. Uh, and so that's another problem with it. it. It deters them. And it also, you know, suggesting earlier, it deters turning schools and clinics and daycare centers into places where people could go to get, you know, voluntary, non-punitive help that they may need to take care of their children. Now, what was the other? Well, I'll come back because okay. I want to bring in Alex. Oh, okay. And who's... I do want to also say something about racial geography. When, Cause you mentioned that in your question. I know, I love that, okay. I, that term. It was just a way to talk about right, Indiana. Right. Yeah, yeah but, that, but that's what, so I thought that, uh, wait, who? That was Ariana. Ariana, oh, then we went to Kayla. Okay, I thought that, Ariana was going to go down the path, if I may. Okay. Of which you, you asked a good question, but the I can complain about South Bend if you the, the racial geography. That term I used it to refer to the concentration of child welfare agency involvement in black neighborhoods, which I imagine happens in Indianapolis or you know other big cities in Indiana. It happens in New York. It happens in Chicago. Um, and New York, uh, San Francisco, uh, I, I spoke in San Francisco maybe a month ago, and they sent me the current statistics. Black children in San Francisco make up 5.5% of the population and 45.5% of the foster care population. And almost all of the child welfare agency involvement is in some housing projects in San Francisco, where most Black people in San Francisco live. So it's concentrated there. And the reason why I thought it was important to focus on this geographical aspect of it is that then everyone in that community is policed. You know, even if they haven't been investigated, even if the children haven't been removed, the entire community is aware of this presence in their neighborhood and it shapes the dynamics of the neighborhood. You describe it as benevolent terrorism. Yeah, it, it is. And yeah. It, it really yeah. comes off the page that mm -hmm, way, for mm -hmm. sure. So yeah. the countervailing value that is often looked to to justify this work is the best interests yeah. of the child. Yeah. Right? That's the overarching standard that's supposed to be applied yeah. in these cases, yeah. setting up Alex and for what you wrote about today. 
Yeah. So first of all, thanks again for, for being with us. I think, you know, it's a real treat. And by the way, so my auntie is Beth Ritchie and I was cool. texting her before this super excited to, to be here with you. Uh, she says, hello. Yeah, I will. I will. Um, so yeah, I wrote about the best interests of the child standard and I kind of tried to connect it back to, you know, what we think of as like these hegemonic notions of motherhood um, that I think, you know, black mothers, especially, you know, middle class and low income black mothers, you know, are stripped of, of the privileges that, you know, are that come along with uh, these these hegemonic notions of motherhood, you know, so thinking of, you know, the, the, the white middle class mother as being someone that society should lift up and support and covet um, and then sort of like contrasting that with, you know, these super harmful stereotypes that you talked about earlier, you know, whatever we want to call it, right? The, the welfare queen, the Jezebel. Um, and, and then, you know, connecting that through to how, you know, uh, reading the story about Miss Peoples and Torn Apart, you kind of see this matrix fall on her head at the same, at, you know, all at once, right? And, and thinking about how CPS or the police are creating the story about her. Um, and I was reading your piece. It's a... Uh, I don't know the name. It's a 2012 UCLA Law Review. Um, just, you know, about how these stereotypes, you say these stereotypes do not simply percolate in some disembodied white psyche. They're reinforced and re recreated by foster care in prison, which leave the impression that black women are naturally prone to commit crimes and abuse their children. And so we see this, you know, again, fall on top of her all at once in this overwhelming, violent way. And so, I, you know, I, I tried to think about this in the context of the best interest standard, which is, you know, feeding this information back into the courts through the through a funnel of CPS and police. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I was wondering whether you could maybe expand on that and, and what your experience is and what your thoughts are about the best interest standard and, and how it kind of feeds back into the initial concept of, of black mothers being stripped of these hegemonic notions. Yeah. Of motherhood. yeah. I feel I should give a shout out to Professor Spinak and her <laughs> book on family courts that's coming out. When's it coming out? August 1st, uh, which is a, a great uh, addition to the literature that finally, right, is coming out. And also uh, was one of the people who encouraged me <laughs> to do a, a 20th anniversary edition that then turned into the Strength and Bond Symposium. And then I ended up writing toward a part. So thanks for all of that. Um, so uh, the best interests of the child, you know, as, as there's just so many problems <laughs> with that standard, because like suspicion of maltreatment, it's just an invitation to include these underlying inequitable, unjust assumptions about, first of all, what is good for children and who are capable of meeting those interests. Uh, so, it, you know, as I said before, there are people who believe that Black parents can never meet the best interests of children because they are categorically incapable of providing the best care. So, you know, as, as you know, if you've taken family law, you know, sometimes the best interest of the child turns into a competition between, you know, in a divorce case or, uh, or foster care, who, you know, who's the better parent. And you, the very people who are targeted by the system already are at a disadvantage because they have a, a status in our society that is deemed to be inferior, you know, by, by their gender, their ability, their race, their class, all of these already put them in this status that regardless of the evidence, you know, they come in with this, uh, uh, this um, handicap, you know, uh, in the golf term. Um, I think, I don't know, I don't play golf, but I, I believe that means that you already have some disadvantage or you don't have the skill or something like that. The wind is not at your back, but in your face. It, okay, is that what it, okay. So they, by their status puts them in that position. Uh, so 
they're already disadvantaged by that. And then all the stereotypes that go along with it. Um, also, another aspect of it is the way in which the harm of separating children from their families, again, families who have already been assumed, you know, to be not only in, incapable, but harmful. You know, this is the thing with the stereotype about Black mothers isn't just neglectful, it's affirmatively harmful. And, you know, something I emphasized in my book, Killing the Black Body, are these stereotypes that we can trace back to the slavery era that Black women's wombs themselves, you know, are biological threats to their children. Uh, and so it, it's so it's so deep, this, this idea of the reckless, harmful Black mother that passes on a depraved lifestyle to her children. And we, we just see this in so many policies and, and, and myths, especially, you know, during the crack epidemic, the idea that crack cocaine in, you know, in Black women's bodies had this peculiar outcome for their babies, the crack baby, that was like no other biological impact of, of exposure to drugs and this idea that it deprived Black women of maternal instinct. You know, so again, these, these biological explanations for the, the incapacity, but the danger you know, of Black women's wombs. Uh, and, and so you start with that, <laughs> then it's, it's very hard then to convince a judge or in a policy more broadly that black mothers are keeping a child with a black mother, especially unsupervised, you know, is in the best interest of the child. Um, and, and then for that reason, this other point I was getting to is then the harm of removing the child is not taken into account. I, I've been in so many symposia, including with the person who <laughs> Joyce probably mentioned, <laughs> um, you know, or meetings or just reading uh, 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 artic scholarly articles about child welfare where, or, or sitting in court hearings where there isn't even a question about the value of the relationship between the children and their parents. You know, I've been talking about black mothers, black fathers. So uh, they're not even mentioned half the time. It's as if they, they're, there isn't even a scintilla of a thought that they could possibly have anything of value. The idea they're not there, you know, they're, they're absent. And so you don't even take them into account. And, you know, if, if they happen to have a conviction, well, then it's used against the mother. So the, you, just, you find in these court cases that, and also in scholarly writing about child welfare and in meetings, that the question becomes, well, how long should we keep the child in foster care? Is it safe to return the child? But not, what about the harm of taking the child in the first place? That just, that isn't computed in the calculation of best interests of the child. So in all those ways, that idea is just rife with you know, with these racist ideas about families um, on top of the discrimination, you know, practically and ideologically against impoverished people. You know, that they, they don't, they don't materially have anything to offer their children. And this really deep seated idea that people who are poor are poor because of some deficit they have, some flaw. 
that they have. And that that underlies the entire system. I mean, this system for all the discrimination against black, brown, indigenous people, it is a system that is only designed for impoverished people, you know, in so many levels. That, that's what the federal policy makes it clear. This is for impoverished families and the history of it, you know, it's always been targeted at impoverished families. It's, it's not, you know, similar to what I was saying about mandated reporting. It's, it's not a system <laughs> for the welfare wealthy family. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. We have about 15 minutes left. And, you know, the book and the way you talk about it, it's just so compelling that abolition of the system is what we need. You indict these non-reformist reforms, um, improving a, um, a, a rotten... Well, Correct that. Non-reformist reforms may be necessary. It's reformist reform ah, that I indict. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Non-reformist reforms that are aimed at abolition on a, the okay. way, you yeah. know what I mean? That are toward abolition. Um, you know, we have to make changes. Like you could say ending mandated reporting is a non-reformist reform. Yeah. You know, it's a reform toward abolition. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, sure. important mm -hmm. correction. So we've got a lot of people in the room here who are going to be working as lawyers when they graduate yeah. from law school. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Fight the system. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So what the heck does that look like? And I'm going to yeah. invite Christine in here okay. who wrote about um, harm reduction. Yeah. And, okay. Um, are there ways to... Yeah. Um, to work today with the vision towards a day when we can abolish the system right. that don't implicate you in it. And yeah. so Christine, yeah, and, and, and I would say, I mean, just as a prelude, I, I think of harm reduction as a non-reformist reform. It's, you know, it is a reform in that it's a change in the system, but it's toward dismantling the system and replacing it with something better. Yeah, go on. Yeah, um, I just want to echo everyone and say thank you for coming in. Um, it's sure. surreal. I, I remember seeing your name in a lot of my syllabuses in undergrad, and so it's crazy to just see oh. you in person. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but your prelude was really helpful. I think that really drives toward the question that I was asking in my paper. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested in thinking about, you know, obviously abolition as a very worthy and important goal, mm -hmm. but ultimately something that is unfortunately, I think long-term, especially just given the systems that we have in place are operating as expected already mm -hmm. today. Um, and so I was thinking about harm reduction as a potential sort of intermediary, like gap filling measure. Um, and I was wondering how possible you think that is, especially for someone who is working as a lawyer, given the punitive role that the law as an institution has sort of played throughout the entire history that you've already covered in today's discussion. Okay. Um, and so just kind of thinking about like the tension between the law as a punitive institution, something that has actually actively worked against the goal of abolition versus playing a harm reductionist role as a lawyer working within the system, say as a criminal defense attorney or a family defense attorney, um, and how possible it is to sort of balance those tensions. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Um, I'm going to be working at the Bronx Defenders in the fall. Cool. I love them. I love them. Okay. That's a, I support that. Okay. So, uh, so first, let me say, I, I don't want to think about abolition as this, you know, distant, far off goal that I will never see. You know, I, I think of it more, and, and others as well, um, abolitionists. Think of it more as uh, you know a continual, ongoing, um, uh, uh, creative activity that we're engaged in as we work toward completely dismantling these systems, as we're replacing them at the very same time. Uh, I, you know that's essential for any abolitionist project. But I think. Ah! <laughs> it's joy. Were your ears burning? <laughs> um, so, you know, it with family policing, for example, 
it's not, you know, no one is saying just stop this system and leave people to fend for themselves in the conditions that this society has created uh, that, that produce the unmet needs of children. Uh, what we're saying is there are much better ways of both meeting the needs of children and not harming them the way the system is harming them. So this, you know, this idea that some people throw out, oh, well, you just don't care about the children. Um, you, you know, you, you're going to leave them to be harmed in their dangerous homes. You know, all of that is just, uh, just a, a false description of what abolition is. It's, it's, building at the same time better ways that, like I said about mandated reporting, instead of having mandated reporting that encourages people who are, have skills that would, could help families take care of children, they're encouraged to report them to a dangerous institution. It's, it does the opposite. It would be so much better to get rid of it. And then give schools and medical centers and daycare centers the resources that they need to help meet the needs of children. If that's the reason, I mean, lots of children are taken away for bo completely bogus reasons that have nothing to do with unmet needs as well. But if we're talking about unmet needs of children, then we have so, such better ways of meeting them than the system that only does, not only doesn't meet them, but harms them. Uh, so uh, part of abolition is harm reduction. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's an essential aspect of abolition. But I think what you were asking also is more specifically, can harm reduction be a type of reform that's non-reformist and that is part of an abolitionist uh, struggle, a part of a vision for a better way of of um, of supporting families and keeping children safe, meeting children's needs. And I think it is important. That's one of the ways I think about, well, should I support, should I be engaged in this particular strategy? Uh, you know, part of what I ask is, does Joyce McMillan support it? But uh, another, <laughs> another thing, is, is it going to reduce the harm that this system is inflicting on, on families? Uh, so reducing the numbers of children who go into foster care absolutely is important. You know, ending mandated reporting. So you reduce the families that are reported to the system. Yes, that's important. Uh, that's why when people ask about, like you're asking about family defenders, uh, should I be a family defender? Isn't it part of the system? Well, the first thing I say is what are families asking for? They want to have a lawyer. Uh, who am I to say, oh, that's part of the system. You shouldn't have a, no. I mean, I should take my lead for the people who are affected by this system or being harmed. If they say we need a lawyer, I'm going to support that. And they need lawyers. They need, and they need a particular kind of lawyer, which is a lawyer that understands the system and that they can trust and you know, who knows how it operates and is dedicated to abolishing the system. And you know, Bronx defenders, absolutely, they've been at the forefront of that. And so I, I now. That doesn't mean that, you know, whatever we say is a good step forward, you know, a good way of reducing the power of this system, reducing the harm it inflicts. You know, we, there's, we still have to work toward making it more effective at reducing the power, making sure that we're not doing something that actually is increasing the power of the system. Uh, we have to be very careful about who we collaborate with. Uh, you know, I take the position that we should not collaborate with this system. So that's why, you know, if you ask, if you said, well, I'm thinking of becoming a lawyer for uh, child welfare, 
Yeah, for AC, I I would just I think no, please go and do family defense instead. Um, that so that that would be my answer. I would make a distinction between the two. Even though you know some people say you know, and you've probably heard this argument, you can do more good inside than outside. Change it from the inside, but there's some things you cannot change from the inside. You get sucked into it, and it's very hard to dismantle it while you're on the inside. You know, these are all strategies and approaches that I, I think are uh, we need to grapple with. That's the conclusion I've reached that uh, I think lawyers who are interested in abolishing this system should work in a position where they're able to do that, you know, where they're, they have the, the freedom to represent the people who are being harmed by the system, not represent the people doing the harm. That's my position on it. Got time for a couple more questions. I think I've hit on all the students who hit on. I've gestured towards all of the students. <laughs> wrote a paper for today. And so a couple more questions, yeah. Hi, thank you. Wait, is that on? Okay, yeah. thanks. Thanks again for being here. Um, sure. Joyce and I were actually talking about this the other day. I don't know if you've seen the movie A Thousand and One yet. I haven't seen it. I've seen interviews of the uh, director and the star of it, and I've seen the trailer for it, but I haven't seen the movie. I mean, just for the trailer, I think, oh, this is so cool. That one thing I don't like is where they say the a mother who kidnapped her child uh, I would rather say rescued her child from ACS, but yeah, but I haven't. I've only seen the trailer. Yeah. yeah. So okay. Well, not to spoil too much of it. Yeah. Um, I think it's a great movie. Everybody should go see it. But I guess in the movie, the same woman who helped, she was like a teacher. The same woman who helped a child, the child get out of a really harmful situation, mm -hmm. ultimately is the woman who ends up returning him back to the system. Oh, I didn't know he gets returned back. And they don't say that in the trailer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, okay. I guess, but she's a woman of color. And so I don't really know if it's a question, but I guess yeah. my, I am totally understanding the abolitionist movement and everything like that. Yeah. But I guess I'm wondering at what point she used to be a social worker herself, I think. Right. And she was saying, well, I, you know, in my past, like, this is what I have to do. But she's a woman of color herself who helped right. him in the beginning and saw that he needed to be in like a different school for his future. Yeah. But then was so quick to just turn him back to the system that she was yeah. trying to protect him from. Yeah. So I guess I'm almost wondering, like, as we move forward, yes, and we should abolish the system. But what about those people who have already been in the system and like working as social workers who may still be, yeah, just feeling like they have a uh, responsibility to abide by the system in which they like were already indoctrinated in. Well, there's something called consciousness raising. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there many of us have been indoctrinated growing up in ideas that we've rejected, or even ideas we might have had five years ago that we reject now. Uh, you know, I've changed my ideas about a lot of things. And uh, because I learned more, you know, I mean, as I said at the beginning, over the last 20 years, I learned more about the meaning of abolition, the principles of abolition. Uh, I've thought more deeply about the harms that the system inflicts. I've uh, worked more with people who have been impacted by it and are leading struggles to end it. So People can change, and uh, I think we have to work with changing people's minds about this system. Now, as I said earlier, when I was answering the question about abolitionists who have suggested uh, divesting uh, uh, from police and moving the money to child welfare, you know that that I think is largely just not knowing how the system operates. Now you're talking about somebody who knows and yet still, but I also uh, mentioned in answering one of the questions, 
mix up which one it was that we have to, I think Miranda, I think, we have to ask why someone invested was, yes. Why, why are people who know the harm still advocating for holding onto the system? And you have to ask, what is their investment in it? And, you know, again, I said, I don't like to psychoanalyze people. That's not my profession, but, um, you know, it, it, and I haven't seen the film, but I know there are a lot of people who know the harm, they've worked in it. I mentioned this about the, the people who um, are advocating to take more children away and that they need white supervision, who claim to be, you know, that, that they're not racist and they're civil rights advocates, you know that there may be uh, an investment in protecting your own image of yourself, you know, not wanting to confront the harms that you engaged in. Uh, I, you know, there are people who have participated in the system and they acknowledge, I harmed people by working in the system and now I'm gonna work against it. So they change their minds. And then there are others who say, I realize that this system sometimes uh, harms people, but I didn't do it. And uh, I am gonna continue uh, doing what I did before, which I can't accept was harmful. I mean, these ideas are so prevalent in academia, for example, where there's so many researchers who are doing research that harms black people and they claim they're doing it to help black people. And you know, I found that deep down, it seems like they just don't wanna admit that they have a privileged position and all the privileges they have aren't because they're better people. It's because they were fortunate to be born into a privileged class in this nation. And, to have all sorts of advantages. And now they think that they're gonna help others who in ways that demean them, that require supervising them, even that assert that they have some kind of genetic inferiority. Now I'm putting on another hat in my genetic research, but you know, why would why do they do that? And I I think deep down many people have this need to justify what they've done in the past that is harmful instead of breaking away from it, admitting that they participated in a harmful system and moving forward. And I, you know, I don't necessarily say that to uh, condemn them as much as to say, we, you know, we all have to ask those questions. And, and, and you know, and I say to people like that, if you, you know, who are defensive uh, when you call out racism. Uh, I do a lot of speaking. I think I mentioned before that I mostly speak in medical schools, a lot of talks to doctors who are practicing race-based medicine that's harming people. And they, they're so defensive. No, I'm, I'm doing it to help my black patients. And you show them actually you, you're harming them. You know, the, there's so much evidence of harm and they, don't want to admit it. And it, and you know, my response is look, if you really want to be anti-racist, you have to confront the racism in your practice. If you're genuinely, you shouldn't be offended by what I'm telling you. You should be welcoming it because you want to change. And that's the that's just the difference between people who sincerely, honestly want to live a life where they are doing what they can to build a more humane, equal society, even if they have to give up something for it, and people who want to claim they're doing it, but they're still invested in the harmful system and they don't want to give it up. And you know, all, all you can do is try to reach those people who are willing to change. And the hope that we have, abolitionists have, is that there are more of those people and they're ultimately more powerful 
than the people who are clinging on to the cruel, abominable, long-lasting, obvious, blatant inhumanity that is intensifying in this nation. You know, if I could just say one more, because this has been on my mind. <laughs> there, we already have such inequality in America. It just cruel, abominable inequality you know, with rising maternal mortality rates and, you know, it's lethal. And the, you know, the, the laws that are being, like the law in Kentucky that makes it a crime to help someone um, uh, in gender affirming care, you know, at, or, and then I read this morning, uh, DeSantis wants to criminalize helping undocumented people. And then uh, there's a lawsuit by a man whose ex-wife had an abortion, suing the people, the women, her friends, which he obviously spied on her private text messages for you know millions of dollars or whatever it is for helping her to get an abortion. And every day there's another law to criminalize people who help someone. And I was just thinking this morning, this is like another layer of cruelty that you're not just punishing people, but now you're gonna criminalize helping people who are in need of help. And that, I think we, you know, we, we have to think who, who are we helping? Do you know what I mean? And, be, and being willing to work toward a society that doesn't punish meeting people's human needs. Well, you leave us in the book with the concept of mutual aid. Yeah. Mean spades work and others yeah. work. And that, yeah. of course, is the flip side of that hatefulness. Exactly. So Exactly. Uh, thank yeah. you for coming today to talk oh, to sure. us. Sure. And, <laughs> sure. Thank you. And for those of you who are wanting to know what you can do, you have to read Professor Spinnick's new book. Yes, definitely. You should take Professor Kagan Gupta's yes, oh, yes. Gupta Kagan's um, clinic. Um, yep. His work too. Right, and so his scholarship important. is yeah. just incredibly important Always in this important. area. Yeah. Um, and uh, and sign up to work with Joyce McMillan and yeah. J. Mac. Oh. Right. Yeah. So exactly. thank you so much for coming, and thank you all.